welcome everyone to this this week's uh, co-production conversation. Um, and unfortunately, we've not got Rob with us this week, so he's he's away on holiday. So I'm going to try and um, fill in for him. Um, I'm Joe Langley, um, and I'm a researcher in Lab for Living at Sheffield Ham University. Um, I'm going to go around and ask everyone to introduce themselves quickly, um, and then I'll try and do a really quick summary. It might be a um, a bit thin because I wasn't able to participate in the whole conversation last week because of poor internet connection, but uh, I'll do my best. So going just from um, on my participant list from top to bottom, we have Chrissy. Can you introduce yourself to everyone, please? Yes. Hello. I'm a new person. I've never been here before and I'm already feeling a little bit scared from what I've seen before the press record. But anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure this will all be OK and I'll be alive by the end of it. <laughs> Uh, I am, what am I? I am someone who is sometimes a psychoeducator, so I do a lot of uh, mental health workshops, teaching people to manage their mental health and well-being. Uh, I'm, I'm also a storytelling practitioner and I run a lot of creative workshops, looking at how people can use stories to better understand themselves and make sense of experiences from when they've been unwell. Uh, I do quite a bit of research as well with the university, stuff around mental health. So, yeah, here, there and everywhere, lots of interesting stuff. And I've got a very nice dog who might bark whilst we're doing this, so we don't have to edit it out now. <laughs> That's super. We're bound to get some interruptions from my children at some point as well. So. Um, Dan. Yeah, so... Um, how, do you think we have to do this every week, the introductions? Because it feels slightly self-indulgent. So the new people, should, uh, so I'm Dan Wilson Home. Uh, 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 it's my second conversation, because I missed one last week, because I was away on holiday. Um, uh, so my background is as a nurse, and I've done uh, health services research for the past 10 to 15 years. I'm currently employed uh, by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, uh, uh, with a particular interest in kind of quality improvement and that sort of stuff. And I realise as well that we, when we introduce ourselves, we don't do it in a, in, we do exactly what we say we shouldn't do in a co-production yeah. session. Talk about all our labels, of which I have few. Anyway. Tell us about who you are, Liz. <laughs> so I'm an OT by background and, uh, and I work, work in the quality team um, um, in SHSC. Um, I actually feel a little bit giddy, like Rob is away and he's like the father of the group and I feel like <laughs> I could be a slightly more rebellious or something this time round. And, and Chrissy's here as well and she makes me laugh, so I, I excuse my, can I excuse my behaviour now? Excuse my behaviour one, and excuse my kids interrupting me too, and hopefully um, you won't see anybody getting out of the shower in the background three if that happens, that would be funny for all of us, so... Do you have a shower next to your living room? Well, we have an upside down house, so, okay. so our bathroom's on this level, and um, and I just saw my dad coming out of the shower with a towel. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, don't see that. Hopefully, he doesn't stroll into the living room. <laughs> um, so last week we had yeah. uh, Anita Kathari, um, professor from. Canada, who was talking a lot about um, something they call integrated knowledge translation and some of the differences from their perspective around what IKT, as they call it, and co production is. Um, she was also talking about sort of co production or IKT very specifically from a research perspective, sort of co production or, or integrated knowledge translation within a research process, um, as distinct to um, co production that might be applied to. Uh, sort of service improvement or um, patient care, patient-centred care um, and other such sort of initiatives or projects. Um, and for her, I think the distinction was really important. Um, I, as I said earlier, I wasn't able to be part of the conversation for the du entire duration because my internet connection kept dropping out. But um, I think there was some kind of really valuable um, points, probably the most valuable when I was not present. <laughs> but uh, I think this week, we really want to focus on Chrissy and, and kind of her experiences of um, what she thinks co-production is and um, her experiences of doing it or things that might be defined. And there was, before we started recording, there was something really interesting that you said, um, which I'm going to pick up on straight away around um, 
kind of not defining things as co-production or not labeling certain things as co-production that you felt others might do um and i just wanted wondered if you could kind of elaborate on that a bit um yeah i think that's just a, a purely personal thing for me because of some of my early experiences with co-production maybe what six years ago when everyone in healthcare was running around going oh co-production this is the future we're going to do all these things it's going to be incredible it's going to change healthcare wow and everyone was very excited as was i and i thought this is brilliant you know i'm going to jump in i'm going to get involved and i did and uh, i got invited to lots and lots of long meetings where I wasn't really listened to. I got invited to more long meetings where I wasn't really listened to. I got invited to long conferences where we really like, in fact, a group of people were invited to a long conference. And I remember one of the, per the people just saying, you know, do they think I'm stupid? Do they not realize I know that we are here as token service users? And a lot of that did go on in the early days of co-production. And I'm not saying I hate co-pro because I see so many people doing it and doing it right. But a lot of that goes on as well. You know, a lot of the, we just need some uh, service users in our meeting and then it's co-produced without actually thinking to actually co-produce, we need to be listening to the service users. We need to be valuing what they're saying. And, and I've seen that not happen. And like I said, this was a, a while ago, so things have probably changed. Um, I, I, I mean, I've uh, felt devalued sometimes when people mention CoPro, because uh, I had another thing that happened not too long ago, where I was actually working for a healthcare trust. So I wasn't a volunteer. And then, uh, I was told that I had to go to microsystems meetings and I had to go along. I was required to be there because it, it was all co-production. And so I said, okay, well, yeah, will you be able to pay me for my time to come then? And they said, well, well, well no. You know, they assumed I'd just be able to go up and give half of my day to go to these meetings. And I'm not a volunteer. You know, and, and I'm not stingy with my time. I do give a lot of my time to services and, and charities. But I just think it's really cheeky to ask someone to go along to a service improvement meeting regularly and, and not offer to pay them any money. So that wound me up about co-production as well. So they're just a couple, a couple of examples, and I'm sure you can see why I started to think from my with my service user hat on i started to think oh i don't think i uh, like this corporal thing i think like for me i'm not i'm not shocked by um what you've said and uh, and and i suppose i've seen it from a health professional sort of background as well and probably felt that excitement around what co-production is and what it could be and how we could do things to um you know listen to um you know everybody in the room including service users equally and the idea of it seems to make complete sense and and how and does it transfer into practice well and if and i think in my experience as well it doesn't always transfer well and you can end up doing things with really good intentions and if the support isn't there isn't the funding isn't there if the training i keep on harping on about that if the training from the facilitator isn't there then you end up with a poor product and uh, and that poor product in a co-production sort of setting in healthcare means often that the people that are uh, left feeling devalued most of all is again the service user and um, and so if if things aren't set up right there's a high risk of things going wrong, but the things that people that suffer are the patients and the service users mostly. And the health professionals are often less fe feeling a bit embarrassed that things didn't go well, but they're still getting paid. Yeah. I think this is, I mean, we've talked previously in the um, last couple of sessions about the impact of tokenism um, on what people trying to do really do co-production um 
and how Ollie was really eloquent two weeks ago around how the um, sort of change from it being a grassroots thing to being a top-down structural thing where that was kind of almost mandated by the NHR, NIHR and other kind of bodies of authority within the landscape um, actually helped to kind of almost force people into a tokenism or tokenistic response to doing co-production yeah, was... given it its bad name and i think i mean I, i've n not heard anything so sort of firsthand f um put so eloquently and so directly to really show the impact of that and i think it's something a message that really needs to be pushed through to nihr so that they can try to take steps to really prevent or mitigate against it because it's, it's having a really negative effect so could is it worth just taking a step back because it wasn't i'm guessing it probably wasn't an nhr because it was probably nhs where the driver for your involvement came from i'm just trying to think back to seven years ago what were the kind of things that were happening so were you involved in the the nhs at that point yes yes this was yeah. the nhs yeah because um this is where my this is where Ollie would have understood the history and chronology of the kind of patient and public involvement stuff. Um, but I know that, and this is this is not a criticism of any specific thing, but I guess because we've got a couple of people who understand the kind of context from Sheffield perspective, Sheffield Health and Social Care have had co-production in their kind of their, their tar as a target for their operation for a, a while. I'm just wondering as if you could talk a little bit to the kind of history of that or is that, do you know kind of how that came into being and how that's been enacted and how that might have been played out in Chrissy's involvement? Well, I don't know. Um, I can only really say from sort of my, my perspective as a, as a clinician, which might not be broad enough um, for, what, for what we need here, but I think it, I, I feel like I might be repeating myself a little bit, but I think, you know, there was a sort of target and I think there was a, um, a statement on the trust website that, that they aim to um, fully embrace sort of co-production um, um, and be a leading kind of trust for it or whatever. And, and um, I think, um, I honestly think that they have tried as an organisation to do that in various pockets and I think that there has been some successes, you know, um, I think probably both me and Chrissy could probably talk about successes within SHSE, but I think we touched on this b before we press record, but um, there's also been some failures as well. And if we turn them failures around into what have we learned and what, what, have, what has come from these failures, um, rather than thinking that we've just done things badly, if we, if we look together at the things that we have learned over the last sort of six years or so, I think we've learned a hell of a lot. And, um, and, and so I don't know whether I, you know, and I'm sure there's, you know, there's Chrissy. I know I work with a lot of other service users that have been connected to SHSE or the NHS that probably also feel that they've been used and abused in co-production co sessions in terms of their time and respect or whatever. And I've heard that time and time again. So I don't think anybody within the trust, within Sheffield Health and Social Care, would be shocked to hear that. But how are we learning from that? And how are we sharing that openly and honestly? I think there's um, one way, I suppose, I'm thinking that we might do that as a trust is to, we've, we've kind of embraced working with um, care opinion. Um, they used to be called mm. patient opinion. And, uh, and I think there, there are pockets of, of people within the trust that are trying to reach out and find out different ways of actually learning, learning from what we've done and what we've done wrong. And uh, so I think that is, that is happening, but I don't think it's really obvious that it's happening to, from, if you're a service user, it might not be obvious that, that the trust are, are actually trying to learn them lessons. But I think, yeah, I think they are. Sorry, I don't know if I was waffling then. No, well, I, it's just an interesting one. I think it's a cultural, a cultural thing that takes, can take years to, years to change. And the idea that we should be learning from our, our failures and, uh, and what we've done wrong. Thinking about um, 
you're going back to your the sort of narrative that you gave us, Chrissy, um, around your experiences. You've experienced um, sort of this collaborative working, whether it's called co-production or whatever it is, um, as a service user, as a, an NHS employee, and as a facilitator as well. And I wondered if you've sort of told us about these bad experiences in a sense that gave co-production a really bad name for you. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about perhaps some of the good experiences um, and whether, you know, your role in those, whether you were the facilitator or a service user um, and what it was that maybe made them different um, to the practical thing. So we can get a sense that it is about listening to people and really kind of valuing what they say, but how did people do that? Um, what was it that made it apparent that they were listening and valuing? Well, <clears throat> the um, amount of my work I was doing was facilitating, so teaching uh, groups of service users that came to uh, sort of mental health recovery programmes. Um, and that was obviously different because I was teaching it. So it was a very unique process. Uh, but yeah, that, that was great because... At that time, um, that service was running and they were happy for that to be completely led by someone with lived experience, that particular course, and it was running really well. So you might have me teaching and then there'd be an anchor in the room who was uh, maybe a recovery coach or something. And they wouldn't really have an active role in the lesson. So we, we would be making places for facilitators with lived experience to teach and sort of run the session. And I think that is the best that I ever saw there, where it was, look what we've done. We've built a course that's run and delivered by people with lived experience. The content's been built by them from the ground up. So that, that was a moment where I thought, yeah, this is doing fantastic things. Can I just... That, yeah, so, so who... So this is going to sound like a silly question, and it, and it probably is a silly question. Who, where, who made that decision that that was the right way to do that? Uh, so one, somebody... of, one of the managers. Okay. Yeah. And how did they go about creating the course content or getting people together? That process of co-creating that course content, how was that kind of led, managed, facilitated? What was, how did that work? Uh, well, me, I went away with another girl called Sarah Burke. Some of you might have come across Sarah Burke. You know, she does quite a bit. Uh, we created it ourselves. So the, the content was just created by people with lived experience as well. So he just said to us, go run with it. And come back to me with it. If I like it, you can do it. So, so, so in a, in a t we produced it. Basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I guess I guess some this this manager must have been influenced by something. Uh, did he? Did he? Uh, was it a he? Sorry. You, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I didn't. So did he? Did he say to you? Um, it's it's obvious that having people with lived experience talking to other people who are experiencing this thing will deliver a much more authentic uh, experience and will have better outcomes. Or did he think? I've seen this happen somewhere else. Should we give it a go? Can can you remember what the kind of the frame of that? Yeah, this, no, I this went, was new, wasn't it? It was new. Yeah, I went up to him and I said, "I think what you're doing is, oh, I can't. I'm going to swear then. Go um, for it. It's fine. <laughs> what you're doing is a bit shit, <laughs> and I think we could make it better. Okay. Uh, and I've got an idea. And this other girl, Sarah Burke, she was with me, so we approached him together. And just said, we think we can do a better job. And he said, okay. So that's, wow. that's literally how it went down. But then we, you know, we've talked a little bit about power and knowledge. And, mm. and, I, and I was thinking a bit about um, vulnerability as well. And um, as a professional with a label in a health service, um, you might have quite a lot, a reasonable amount of power and um and are you um uh, how would you describe somebody in an organization that's willing to put aside their power and listen to somebody you know with lived experience of mental illness um that actually turns around and says 
what you're doing is crap. I can do it better. You know, is that a rare quality um, or do we need more of that within healthcare? Um, and and how, how, how do you get to be that person as well? You know, how, and how did you feel, Chrissy, when they were prepared to listen to you? When what? When the, um, when the manager was prepared to listen to you, when you turned around and said, what you're doing is crap, I can do it better. You know. well, I, I, just, I knew he was going to listen. I just knew he was the type of person who would have listened. You just get a feeling, don't you? Yeah. So it, I wonder if... So I wonder if at that point there was power associated with the voice of lived experience, be that through a policy driver or something else, or whether you're suggesting this manager was just predisposed or Chrissy you delivered it in such a way that he could possibly not have ever said no <laughs> I think there will have been other things going on with yeah. him he was it was a bit of a um ex-hippie type that didn't like the constraints of the NHS and was always the one that wanted to do the wacky things and, and upset people and you know <laughs> so it, 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 I'm sure you're getting a grasp of his character <laughs> Did as long as you do don't well name him. <laughs> no, he didn't do well with management. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so you, you want mavericks and rebels. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, was, that was you being um, brought in. No, 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 not being brought in, coming forward. No, and, no, okay, yeah. Mission. So after that process, you, you, you took over the content creation and delivery of that component yeah. of somebody else's healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so how, how did you describe, how did you describe your role in that? When people asked you why you were stood in front of them, how did you explain what you were doing, why you were doing it? Uh, well, I talked to them about my uh, mental health story to tell them a bit about what had happened to me personally. And that I, I wanted to find a way to help others. And that was basically it. That was the sole reason I was there. And then I'd say, you know, I've had to go on hundreds of really boring training courses and this, that and the other. And now what? You know, guess what? I finally know what I'm on about. And I can give you lots of advice. Are, are there other examples where you've been... So that's a kind of um, wonderful story that's focused on teaching and service delivery in a sense. And I just wondered whether there was anything contrasting with that that may have been, um, I don't know, more research orientated or um, where your role might have been slightly different rather than being a facilitator. You might have been either there for your professional hat on as an NHS employee or um, as a participant in someone else's process or maybe as a service user yourself. Is there any other yeah, I'm, I've done uh, the, like the research project I worked on with Dan. Uh, I was a research assistant on that. Um, and I'm just trying to think about that one. <laughs> yeah, so... so, uh, so was <laughs> when was that? When did you do that? Uh, so it was... <laughs> we, we produced the report on the 21st of December 2018. <laughs> Oh, so I think it was the kind of year before before that. that yeah yeah um yeah so I came in on that as a research assistant and um it was nice because the university really valued that uh I had experience relevant in the sort of mental health department that I had personal lived experience and that pushed me up a pay grade so that I thought that was wonderful because we often find within healthcare places, if you've got lived experiences, it pushes you down the pay grade into the, let's give you some appreciation money. So it was lovely to be, be part of an institution where they valued that part of me as well. And they valued my narrative stuff and, and the whole package. That was brilliant. I think, I think that's a really interesting point to pick up on, whether it's, so that you mentioned it twice now, how, 
um, when you were there as a in the microsystems work as an NHS employee, you were expected to come in your own time, not in your paid time, in your own time, and as a volunteer in your own time. That was the expectation. Um, yeah. And then this remuneration of of people participating in the process as service users as well is so often um, framed as just you know expenses um, and they'll be happy to contribute because they're benefiting from it and they're benefiting their peers and so on. And I think it's a really interesting kind of political question around how one defines co-production when there are people who are sacrificing their time alongside others who are being paid to be there. Mm -mm. We, we do have to put our cards on the table here though, because uh, we were lucky to work with Chrissy as part of the project team. Mm -hmm. And as she described, she was she was paid for that input we also had some workshops where individuals were reimbursed for their time and travel through vouchers not through the same level of funding as chris we were able to pay mm. chrissy so there is that even within the kind of best intentions there still is this kind of a, a compromise between how much money we had to deliver a project and and how we'd want to reimburse people Liz, did you come along to any of those workshops? Uh, no, I didn't. I, no, I don't know what you're talking about. No, that's fine. Yeah. I, um, I, have, I have to say, I think, uh, you know, obviously I don't like co-production. I, I think <laughs> our, our project, if, if I had to choose one where I'd jump up and say, I did this wonderful co-production project, oh, it no, would be no, ours. No, no, it would <laughs> it would be ours seriously we'd got a team it was multidisciplinary we were all different we'd got service people with lived experience you know we had about five different people in the team from five areas of life and it was just genuinely different people working together so what made it good tell, tell me specifically about what why that one stands out for you compared to some of the others because they understood paying the people that came to our workshops. So we put a big workshop on and, and often people can be like, oh, well, people just be happy to get a sandwich. But Dan and, and everyone else we were working with, they understood that we have to pay these people something. And we did pay them well for the time to come along to something like that. So that really pleased me. Um, what was yeah, different? What, Sorry, in the in the kind of opening description of poor co-production, you talked about long meetings and not being listened to, and then you know long conferences where people would then just say, "I'm here as a token service user." What was different about the workshops that made you feel that they weren't there as tokenistic and they were being listened to? Because I was being listened to, mm. absolutely. But I mean, also, I, I was there, I was introduced as a, a lived experience practitioner, um, you know, and I talked about some of the work I did. And I could see that, I mean, I remember at one point, Dan wanting to learn something off me, and that was really nice. You know, it was just people learning from one another. We were all from very different knowledge areas. I didn't understand what Dan and Rachel talked about half the time. <laughs> they're, they're academics. But they were nice people, and I could tell they were listening to me. The two aren't mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> but but just, uh, yeah, respect, respect, and listening. That's what we had there, I think. Mm. So I think I think the other thing was there was the intent. So I know we talked about intentionality, the kind of intent of this activity, and so I think that right from the beginning we were trying to explore what kind of some of the interesting research questions were around the use, the use that's not the right word, the, um, involving people with lived experience in a range of different activities uh, within kind of health and social care. And um, so in some ways we had to practice what we preached and I guess involving me from the outset is a bit like involving you Joe from the outset we have a sort of idea around what is the right way to do this and it might not be the right way but it, we can always move stuff towards uh, the right-ish way and so there was a very clear attention to 
making sure that if people were involved they were reimbursed that the the way that we try to set up those days allowed everybody a chance to participate and have a voice and even down to the fact that we try to make sure that um, even when we were trying to identify uh, themes that were coming out of a, a, a literature review which we all know is not the most exciting of, of things to to grapple with um, that people could kind of vote on which things they felt were most important rather than us being slaves to the fact that the literature review said this was where the gap was or otherwise so we tried to kind of make sure that the, the, the process of involvement and engagement was as transparent as possible and had the lowest bar to accessibility as possible to try and make it easy for people to be engaged. Uh, it didn't help, do you remember? It was when the blizzard <laughs> hit. <laughs> we were trapped in Sheffield train station as a foot of snow fell throughout the duration of the and at the end of the day, the only people are left were about were me, Chrissy, and then about <laughs> five bewildered medical students who I can't even remember where they came. But anyway, it was all good fun because we're looking at kind of trainees and experience. And, and actually, some of the some of the ideas that came out of that were starting to unpick the fact that I always remember because uh, Chrissy ran a, a ran a group, a breakout group that was specifically looking at what what the training requirements are for those individuals other people with lived experience who get pulled into roles like Chrissy so I, I always remember that yeah so it might well be a really sensible and transparent idea to involve people with lived experience in these things but you talk very clearly about the fact that at the end of some of these sessions that you've done you were absolutely exhausted from giving of yourself to others and because um, you talked about uh, delivering sessions for medical students and creating this brilliant safe environment where medical students could ask you questions, you being somebody with lived experience, but then feeling so confident and so sure that they could ask you anything that they asked you anything. Yeah. <laughs> and actually that was really quite hard for you and your own health at times. So the fact that uh, we, th these are not risk-free kind of ventures to bring people into these spaces and actually that again comes back to that preparation and, and planning phase um, so yeah in involvement and engagement isn't this kind of we want to do it but we have to do it properly and think about the consequences for everybody involved um, um. Sorry, you've been talking for far too long. Sorry, yeah. No. So I was really interested in what you were you were saying, but um, I was just thinking back to the paper as well that you that you've um, that you're probably linked to this um, podcast, weren't you, Dan? But talked about um, talked about their, that uh, about people offering um, their lived experience and actually the how challenging that is and what you, what are we asking of people. You know, when, when we, I mean, I know it's done quite a lot in mental health now and we hear it quite a lot, but, but that doesn't mean to st say that, that, um, that one, that it's okay to ask in a casual way for people to offer their sort of lived experience and to not to value it and whether, you, whether you're showing value in terms of payment or understanding in terms of how much we're asking of people in order to share their own sort of lived experience. Um, not just um, as a personal, you don't know where somebody is in terms of their own experience um, with, with, with their own health. Um, so you don't know what, how vulnerable they're going to feel. And that's a really personal thing for somebody to deal with. Um, but also what you're asking them to do in terms of, we still live within the mental health services in a very medical dominated um, arena or space in which actually there are still quite strong views um, of um, you know people with mental illness um, not 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 but well being mad or insane you know we we I I don't think me or anybody that we're talking to in this podcast has that view at all but we probably all know people that still do and even if they don't know it themselves you know sometimes you know what we say on our actions show that people still have that kind of entrenched kind of view of what mental illness actually is 
and and you know how much should we listen to somebody that has a mental illness or that is ill or you know or has a really different take on the world to what we might have as um as a you know white middle class person you know that has lived in britain all her life or whatever and um and that kind of idea that actually if we are truly co-producing and actually we co-produce something that the outcome is uncomfortable for the professional or the people within power to deal with are we ready to accept that and i mean for me i think we're a long way off that but i think it's just i think it's a really i think it's a really important issue not to forget that what we're asking of people to share and how we value that as a service or, or within that group in terms of the co-production space or, or beyond. And I think that we need to revisit that in these kind of conversations. Because I think there's a risk of being blasé about it sometimes. In my experience within mental health services, it's like, oh, somebody's sharing their lived experience again. You know, great, we all value and appreciate that. But are we, are we realising what, what, what it might mean to people? I'll shut up now, Dan. <laughs> I think, I think there's there's two so there's, there's loads of um, yeah. kind of things that you've just said there, which has sparked loads of thoughts in my head. I think one of them relates to how people are enabled to tell their lived experiences. And one of the things, really interesting things, I picked up from Chrissy's video that she shared with us is the diversity of ways in which you enable people to tell those stories, the different media, the different forms. So it's pictures, paintings, um, poems, stories, written words, um, all sorts of, and, and that's so important to enable self-expression um, is this diversity. But it's also in the research world, it's something which is sometimes really hard to write into, to get funding because they, they like methodologies to be so nailed down and not responsive to the needs of people in the moment. And so in, in enabling a, a kind of slightly less constrained model of doing co-production or collaboration with um, service users and people with lived experience that enables a, a more free form way of interaction and expression um, so that they have, they can choose their media or their way of expressing their lived experiences, I think is really important. Um, and I think that's something there around methods, which perhaps feeding back to funders, there needs to be a kind of slightly more open or more tolerant um, perspective on, on what those can be and how, and, and not defining them too much. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, I think, how, how not just it, it, them existing as stories, but what one does with them is so important because that's the other thing around listening to people active listening it's not just having a, a kind of nodding as they tell their story it, it's not simply having their story as an exhibition for others to peruse um that's almost a kind of voyeuristic kind of thing which almost kind of verges on the um kind of i don't know um enjoyment of looking into other people's lives without actually doing anything about it yeah. and i think there's got to be it, it's the it's the way which you you rather than just taking that that evidence from people that that in a kind of extractive kind of way and publishing it in a paper or putting it into a digital archive or something is doing something with it mm. and that i think is sometimes especially in the kind of academic world it's not really thought about, they, they, and it relates to that whole idea in the academic world of impact being a public publication. Mm. And that, again, that devalues, goes back to what Chrissy said right at the start, devalues people's involvement. It is, it might seem like it's listening better, but in a sense, if you don't act on it, it's not really listening. Mm. So that, that was the thing that occurred to me. And I'll, so what, by listening, what if we hear things that we can't do stuff about mm. you know so if you say what do you think of our service or what do you think of this way of delivering this particular thing and oh it's 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 crap um so the, the problem is we don't have chrissy's everywhere who can say and actually i can see what needs to be done differently mm. um imagine you are somebody who isn't quite as uh, able to articulate that 
as Chrissy, but who's receiving a poor service somewhere else. How do we how do we enable those individuals to have a voice to be able to influence how that that gets through? I mean, we probably all have had poor service in one form or another from some organisation or other, be it hopefully not as often from our health providers. But how how do how are we encourage? So I, I was I was I was struck by your uh, reference earlier, Liz, to care opinion as a means of getting feedback. Um, but is, is feedback in itself kind of co-production? How, how does that sit alongside involvement engagement? And how do you think that fits? Um, I think it's just part of the jigsaw really, isn't it, I suppose. And, uh, but I think feedback is just one part of that jigsaw. And have we got that right yet? And, um, and actually, I suppose care opinion um, is my first um, experience of actually um, a group of people that are trying to get feedback in the right way um, in terms of it being a very open plat digital platform in which people can put both positive and negative. Um, and it's very, you know, very open to professionals as well as service users. And, um, and, you know, they're trying to get the data that, that they can then use to sort of feedback to trust about what, what, what service users are saying. And I suppose for me, that data needs to be used within a co an, another system, which is co also co-produced, I suppose. And so that's, yeah, I think that's just part of the picture. Um, but I, uh, you know, I think getting feedback from service from from service users um in ways that they feel comfortable you know and um a a, a kind of co-production program that's organized and arranged and delivered somewhere in a room somewhere um within an hour um is not going to be right for lots of people who actually may want to contribute to the delivery of services or to that particular program and so i think we've got to embrace different methods in how we actually get feedback that then this we can is, actually use this is how i get some of my feedback i make it into storyboards yeah that's brilliant but it works and it's fun just do you get participants to do those storyboards for you? Yeah, I get them to build a character. They, I draw that one, but yeah, they get to draw, draw me a few panels with a character on, telling me, you know, what's good, what's shit. Well, no, I don't say that in the workshops. I'm very sweary when there's a record, recording button on. Tell me what's good, what's bad, what would you like to see, how have you found it? And uh, yeah, they just write it out for me, and then I go away and make a storyboard. It reads like a an, um, coherent narrative. It works really well. What is that in your narrative storytelling sessions then? No, this was for some research work I'd been doing and we needed to get feedback on how the sessions had gone. Mm. So this was looking at um, mental health and technology. Mm. So that, and that's again, that's some research I've done where I think co-productions worked actually even though i wouldn't have called it that <laughs> what would you have called it i don't know everyone just working together <laughs> collaboration <laughs> yeah um but yeah i, I was hired for this uh, research project for my narrative stuff but they also wanted someone with lived experience to guide them because they would be running workshops for people living with mental illness so you know with me having the narrative skills and the lived experience they thought i'd be the best person to uh, approach and that was really really good and again it comes back to this thing i was listened to you know the two researchers they'd tell me an idea that they'd had something they wanted to talk about and i would say i, I don't think you should talk about that i don't think that type of topic is safe just to spring on people in a room do maybe wanted to talk about things about suicide and stuff and i warned them off a lot of areas that weren't appropriate without full safeguarding you know 
and uh, and I also talked to them out of doing it in this horrible university building because uh, I said you know we're getting these people to come to us and putting them in an environment that's not familiar for them and it's quite scary it's an horrible classroom I think we should rent a really lovely cafe in town and so they went okay yeah we'll do that and uh, and also they, they only wanted to do one session and I said you know you can't expect to sit people down in two hours and say come on throw all your stories at us that's not happening we need three sessions and it'll be lovely organic nice and the stories will just flow out of them and it'll be nice for everyone and yeah i was listening to on all that so yeah that's a uh, good co-pro there's there's uh, again there's so many things that you've said there I, I think that picking up on that last one about the rather than one session several sessions is so often um people always come with a story to tell and unless you give them the opportunity to tell their story properly then they leave in a sense dissatisfied with and if if it's not just storytelling the whole process is about telling the stories and experiences and then moving on to say okay what can we change you really need to rather than jumping into the oh what can we change you really need to start off with that so what's your story first mm. But I think breaking it over several sessions, again, people reflect on things in between sessions and they come to the subsequent sessions with kind of slightly reframing or rejigging their story in some way um, or refining it in some way, which is also really important. Um, but it's all that overall sense of being valued as well. Yeah, it's, it, and it's, it's about that humility of the researchers. So if, if what you're going to hear is going to make a difference, you have to have the opportunity to come back and meet these people again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you are just extracting data from them mm -hmm. and then waving them off into the distance. Yeah. And, and you can do that in lovely ways, don't get me wrong, but unless there's that real commitment to, oh, this is what we heard last time. So this is what we've been thinking about while, you've, while we've had a, a period when we've, we've had some time. And this is what we're going to do today, which builds on last time and the things that you said. But also, we, we'd like to introduce this concept or this idea and see what you think about that or we'd actually got we've got a specific question today which is how might we do things better because we've heard what your experience has been and that's been very varied but we need to now kind of move forward and build on that and then yeah so I think we do we uh, so the number of times that, that Joe and I have kind of gone back to people and said yeah we need to do a series of workshops and they're gonna have to have some time in between them because stuff develops in between this time and uh, very very occasionally we give people kind of homework to do but we've discovered that nobody likes homework so uh, <laughs> try not to even do that um but yeah i think it, it that isn't about us being fussy that is about us respecting and valuing that involvement engagement and and and, and you have to give that some time and space to sink in and and develop and change between sessions so i think that's really really key the other your, your other point about the cafe is exactly right as well that attends to power so if you are in the university where the researchers are all happy and comfortable because they know mm. where the toilets are, they know where their lunch boxes, they've got their office down the way, they can go and have a <laughs> private chat somewhere else. That's their home territory and that's where their power sits. Mm. And if you're inviting people in, you're inviting them into your domain. And this kind of shared neutral space is something else that we often look to try and do and, and, and would always try and do within kind of budget constraints of things. Um, so yeah, no, I, I I agree. These things that kind of come across as as as, as a bit uh, like the the window dressing, actually are indicative of some really important things that all come back to power. We always come back to power. Yeah. Um, it, uh, and but without addressing that, you just recreate society in another room. Mm. We recreate these inequalities, and it it comes back to something I think we probably discussed in the first week, which is. These workshops should be that moment where you elevate and make people safe and you divest some people of some power and you try and empower other people to allow that proper exchange of knowledge to happen. Um, so I, I, 
Go on. It, 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 it's so true what you said, but I think it, it has to extend beyond the workshops because otherwise it remains an extractive process. Because if after the workshops are finished, you revert back to preferencing your own knowledge over what you've extracted from these participants in the workshop process, then it remains the same thing. It remains this kind of um, traditional research model. Um, and I, I think it's so important that the, the, the opportunities for interacting with people exist in those workshops, but the mindset you've just described around divesting yourself of some power has to flow before and through and beyond those kind of points of interaction with people with lived experience. They have to flow through into the work after that as well and feed him back. Otherwise, when you feed back to participants, they'll see it. They'll recognize that they've said these things and then they've not been kind of represented in the right way afterwards. Um, going back to your description of that project, Chrissy, would you say that your role in that, your specific role was advisory to the researchers or did you actually get involved in doing the research as well, the, the, the kind of workshops, the analysis of data, all of that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, I was hired as, as a creative practitioner. So okay. to my job was to do facilitate the workshops. Right. And then I would often take a lot out of the workshops and produce uh, visuals and graf graphics for the researchers. Um, I'd I had a researcher in on the session who would take notes and things. But, uh, but yeah, I did most of the, um, most of it, really. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um. I think there's, I mean, there's so much that's come out of this. And, and I think that the going back to that intentionality, I think that the words that you've used in preference to co-production as being collaborative rather than extractive. I think that has to be part of that intention at the very start. Go on, Daniel, smirking. No, I was just because they weren't the words that, so Chris, did you say it was working together? Working together. Yeah. Working together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, when you were all speaking, it was just kept on coming back to me again about the importance of, I know we said this before, but I think it's worth saying again, just the, it's kind of like, I think we know roughly what, what makes a good co-production session, but everything we talk about needs investment and needs proper time and planning and thought. And, you know, I think in, going back to the conversation we had about the lessons we've, we've learned probably as part of the trust that I work for of um, not always getting things right. Um, is that because we haven't realized just how much we need to invest in this um, to actually get it right? Um, and probably the money hasn't been there, but is directed to other places rather than this. And then, and then is it not directed to that because actually the research around and the evidence base around what co good co-production can actually produce in terms of good outcomes and cost savings. Are we still not there yet in terms of the research? And so is, is, that, where the, is that where the focus has to be in terms of co-production? I know it, it's probably a mixture of, of different focuses, but, but I just think in, until we have really good understanding of the amount of investment that's needed in co-production we are still going to have these pockets of bad examples um of people doing things you know so i think there's, there's two things there isn't there so one is that i think that where so uh, i think we agree that the, the, the trust has uh, the, the the best intentions absolutely yeah. But within that, sometimes it'll 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 do stuff wrong. So there is something there about um, how can we ensure that whenever anybody sets out on this, they've got some sort of uh, support to guide them along the way, so they don't make those same pitfalls that Chrissy will have no doubt seen and experienced those in those kind of early years of stuff being done in the name of co-production. I'm sure Ollie would say that whether that's co-production or not. In, in its kind of truest sense, but we're trying to avoid that bear pit for the moment. Um, but so there are some things that you can do to make it more likely to get towards working together than than it can sometimes feel. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Go on. Crossing your fingers, I always find, helps me keep a, a point that I want to say in my head. So the resources that you need to invest in co-production. So this comes back to Rob's initial, initial uh, devil's advocate question about how do we know that co-production makes a difference? Mm -hmm. um, which I think is probably, it should be the focus of one of these conversations. But I, I think that we probably slip into the it's hard to measure kind of stuff and therefore it's not captured. And actually, who knows uh, the power and the impact of Chris's involvement on individuals' careers and lives so far. We don't capture that going forwards. That was one of the things that came out of the work that Chrissy and I are involved with. One of the things was what difference does this training that's led by people with lived experience make down the line to the trainee mm. and then down the line to the person receiving care from that trainee. So yeah. we can potentially evidence this, this, uh, I don't know, that's just one form of kind of involving people, but we don't currently capture that data. So we're never going to be able to show the value because it's tricky to capture. Yeah. So we, we don't measure the stuff that's tricky to measure. I think it's, there's, I mean, the, the under-resourcing bit is really, is really key. And I think one of the challenges that we've had is that it's, it's always been linked to this lack of evidence around the, the proof in the pudding, so to speak, of the benefit of co-production. But there are other sectors that take on and invest heavily in these kind of relational aspects up front. So, I mean, even just taking um, law and legal systems, I mean, solicitors have huge budgets for investing in um, clients, wealthy clients and procuring wealthy clients. I mean, they, they have massive kind of corporate budgets for wooing people and investing in those relational aspects i mean it's a very transactional thing it's a very client-based thing but actually the, the, the relational side of it is really important because it's about building relationships with people before you actually start working together and that unless you start enable that process to be incorporated into any of these projects and resource it effectively then it can't really happen which kind of sets a poor groundwork for any kind of collaborative model of co-production or whatever it is to then actually take place if you haven't really given sufficient resources to invest in developing building trust building relationships building any of that kind of stuff if it's always expected that you do that before your research starts yeah that how how can it happen it's, un, it's in, in many cases it's not resourced at all by the system you're expected to develop those relationships and build that trust before you get any funding. Mm -hmm. How, how, on, I, I don't, that's one of the big puzzles for me. Well, so actually the project that Christy and I were involved in was funded by the university to develop ideas for bids. So we were in a position to actually have a properly funded kind of early co-production stage mm -hmm. to that uh, process, but that is rare. It's, yeah. it's not the norm um and, and similarly i mean it's it's the, the patient public involvement stuff is the same isn't it you're supposed to get your 500 pound grant from the rds to do yeah EPI 500 pound for a hundred well five hundred thousand pound uh, project yeah. but then yeah yeah so that that that, that again is um very aware of time yeah no what i was time, just what time do you finish it's whenever, whenever we stop talking. <laughs> oh, well, well, I need. Can I just tell you a bit about the narrative masterclass? Yes, because please. I, yeah, I we'll like to. To, to hear about that. Um, so, because I do think it's co-production deep down. I've just got a problem with the word. Did the, Did anyone get a chance to watch the film about it? Oh, yes. brilliant, lovely. Oh, excellent. I like it when people study ahead. Um, so, so as have you seen, yes, this is something we do at the medical school. And we'll be going into our, obviously COVID's messed things up a bit, but we will be going into our seventh year running this class. And last year, I was really pleased to get it into Hallam University as well, teaching to um, uh, nurse, adult nursing students. So I'm making traction with it. And 
it is a, well it basically studies narrative the narrative master class and the way we run it we have half of the class who are med students and then the other half of the class are people living with mental illness or mental health difficulties we get them all in a classroom together and i go around university and i choose a nice classroom so it's not in the med school you know, I go and find a nice one with lots of dusty old books and proper old chalkboards. I find there's a good room, so it's nice for everyone. So med students aren't in their zone, and these um, and the service users are like, wow, it's Indiana Jones territory. <laughs> so we, we pick a great room, and we bring everybody together. And obviously, I tell them all, you know, they are all students. In this room, you are students of narrative. You're not med students and service users. You are students of what we are doing. So it brings everybody together. And uh, it's a course that really doesn't talk about mental health that much. I will talk about my own mental health journey and the reason that narrative played such a big part in that, sort of rediscovering my sense of self after having it shattered by a breakdown. So I'll... I'll frame what we're going to be doing by talking about that and saying you know that will be the experience of a lot of people who are living with mental illness and then i just throw throw the med students into some strange kind of hell that they've never known before i get them writing poetry <laughs> so this is all on the first day of meeting them so everyone's just getting caught in really strange places so yeah the med students are writing poetry uh, and then for the next four weeks, we just do creative activities like writing, drawing. We go out for walks together. We go out looking for objects to collect. Um, we go and we bring in objects from home that might hold stories for us. Each week, we focus on talking about a different aspect of ourselves, who we are, why the world matters to us, what things in the world matter you know what hopes aspirations do you do you have we, we, we get onto all that sort of stuff and um and it's wonderful because these conversations are taking place between a med student and someone living with a mental illness and there'll often be, be, be a generation gap there which is nice as well because we have quite a lot of elderly people well older not elderly older people come to the uh, the last one we did so you see these relationships unfold and it's, it's really, really nice. And at the end, we all work together, all of us, to create an exhibition. So we all create a final piece of art that is something that we want to say about ourselves. And we'll create it and then we make a big exhibition. And then we all come in with an exhibition day and everyone gets to look around other people's work. And uh, it's just it's such a lovely way to end that session. And everyone's so proud of what, what they've done. And uh, it's, it's very, you know, it can be very, very emotional for the medical students. I've had a lot of people uh, come in tears to me, thanking me, um, just saying that for them, it's the first time they've been valued beyond anything um, than their ability to pass exams and remember stuff. And all of a sudden they've met me and come to this class and I want to know about them as a person, who they are. And that's, a bit, that's why I think this class is good because it hits them all. I think every single med student I've worked with will carry that class in them, I really do. I look back at the feedback and, you know, it's often saying this is not a course. This is a journey. You know, they're really, um, it just, it's a different way of learning from it is, you know, it's experiential learning and it's very different to anything they'll ever do again. But I do think we make a big difference just with that one class. They'll never be, they'll never be med, med when the doctors, they'll never just be like algorithmic dialogue. Yes, yes, no people. They'll listen to people's stories. I guarantee it. I just, yeah, I think uh, I'm, I want to, I, I think that you're, sorry, hold on a minute. First of all, before I comment on that last thing, I just want to say that 
I think it's brilliant and um, the the work that you've done and what you've described um I was just writing down some notes as you were describing it because it it, these reoccurring sort of themes keep on coming up when we talk about what good co-production is and firstly it's kind of like that good facilitator whether you have lived experience of a health complex health condition or not I don't I, I don't know how much that matters and what people's opinions are of that but you are open about that and whether it's more about being open about who you are and what you're what how you know showing some vulnerability whether that's more key than having lived experience of mental illness I'm not sure but good facilitator making an effort to flatten that sort of platform and kind of making an effort to kind of make sure everybody feels equally valued is something that you you've mentioned you do some you do an activity that redresses that sort of power and um, and getting people to feel out their comfort zone and the medical students feeling outside their comfort zone just as much as like anybody else within the room um, might have experienced as well and do a lot of work on kind of relationship building and um, and sort of all the exploratory stuff so I think there's loads in that that you've said that I think just really kind of shouts to what a good co-production session should be. Your last point is something I totally want to agree with, but I worry that it's not true in the sense that I, what I feel as a healthcare prof professional is that we go into the job with high hopes, with an open heart, with a strong desire, but it's not the people that, um, that have failed within the work that people have done within SHSC or beyond that have um, made a bad co-production session bad. It's the, the other things around it, isn't it? So what my worry is, is that the, the medical students on your class will remember that narrative class and put it in their little bubble of hope and joy and what they want to be. But actually, when you come into their health system, there is you know the power and the forces and the systems are too strong um in my opinion and um and i think you get anyway i'm, I'm not going to go on too much but um i hope what you said at the last point is true that's all i can say well, i hope so but if not i'm gonna have to instill more of that chrissy spirit if you've got <laughs> that evil dark forces like that. <laughs> it's a it's a it's the start of a um kind of wave of change isn't it it has to happen i mean it's, it's trying to overcome some really big forces systemically and culturally and everything else mm -hmm. and it can't happen overnight it has to happen kind of a, a process of attrition almost um, until you reach kind of critical mass i guess um but I think another thing that I picked up from what you're saying there, Chrissy, as well, especially describing the medical students, is that you're drawing out of them not just their kind of um, professional role, their medical knowledge. It's recognizing them as holistic beings, not as a label. And I think that there's something in the whole of this idea of working together or co-production or collaborative whatever it's called whoever it is whether it's a researcher or a, um, an OT or a doctor or a service user or someone with whatever it is it's just valuing those people for their holistically as what they bring as a whole mm -hmm. yes they have some specific expertise that will be valuable to the initiative that you're doing whatever it is but actually everything else they bring as a person as well is also valuable um, and br encouraging people, finding ways to enable people to contribute their kind of whole being rather than just that one aspect of their kind of professional hat or their service user label or their informal care label or whatever it is. That kind of reduces the contribution that they can potentially make and shutters it down. Um, and that kind of model, I think that, that way of working with people limits and constrains the kind of potential any kind of project framed in that way could achieve. Um, so I, I think that, I mean, I, I, I echo what Liz said, it sounds fantastic what you're doing. I'm so glad that Hallam have taken it on as well. Um, it'd be really, I, I, I guess um, it might be something that you'd have to speak about with each group of participants, but whether these exhibitions could be more publicly accessible so that other people could 
um, kind of get a chance to kind of witness these stories as well, um, or almost in you know, a performative. I don't know if there's anything, you know, kind of um, book. They have a book reading sessions or something like that. So storytelling sessions, like in the more performative style. I don't know, um, but open I mean, to other students to engage in. I mean, the other thing is you've now got seven years. So some of these yeah. are no longer even junior doctors. Yeah. So there's yeah. a chance to kind of follow up longitudinally and see if that difference, see if they do remember it. And Get see in touch with is. Chrissy, people. Yeah. yeah. Some, of them, some of them follow me on Twitter and they always check in with me. I've got a few from ages ago. Yeah, they still remember me. Yes. There's definitely, a, there's definitely a project in there. I mean, that, that answers the question about what difference does it make in this, yeah. this very specific case, but you can only answer it specifically. So, um, yeah, maybe there's, maybe there's something to do there to find out the lasting legacy of Chrissy Power <laughs> against the forces of dark socialization. Chrissy Power, that'd be brilliant. <laughs> this, has been, this has been a really... Um, wonderful conversation um i've really enjoyed this um it is approaching half past five so i'm really aware that if we don't kind of shut the recording down soon it's going to be too big to transfer to dan at all um and he'll make some excuse by not being able to edit it or you'll be fine joe just just top and tail it <laughs> <laughs> um I, I i think there's there is a common theme that's come through all of the conversations we've had around this intentionality and it links so strongly to this idea of power mm -hmm. so the intentions that people have when they say they want to work together with people is so important whether it is this tokenistic thing that you started off describing at the start of this conversation chrissy um something that's researchers feel they have to do or, or staff in a hospital feel they have to do because that's what's being imposed on them and it ends up being this awful experience for everyone and never achieving very much um but if it's to be done properly then the intention needs to follow through with this kind of sense of humility from those who are setting it up leading it um, this recognition of the value that people bring, whether they're professionals or they're in a professional capacity or as a lived experience and recognizing that they come as people, not just for their experience or their professional know-how. Um, and it needs to be this kind of journey that's not extractive, but this kind of continuous working together. Where you do it is so important. Um, a good facilitator but someone who has the ability to open themselves up and make themselves vulnerable as well. Cause I think vulnerability was something that I would really like to pick up on a little bit more in one of the future conversations because people come and they are in a vulnerable position, but the facilitator, I think being able to share something of themselves in that way really helps to build that trust and enable people, other people to then open up in response. And all of those things to do with flattening hierarchy. So making sure that people are there as a, um, uh, feeling as part of one group, one working group. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that any of you others want to kind of add. Was that a reasonable summary of what we've kind of covered? Yeah, awesome. yeah. yeah. Loved it. Thank you so much. <laughs> where, do, where does this go what is it anywhere in the world somewhere it twitter. goes on twitter it goes on youtube and then it's tweeted and shared yeah. via social media <laughs> all right well, at least keeps telling me about it but I, I had no idea what it was